when I last left you, um, when I checked in on you on Thursday, I was, I had just gone to Bristol, England, the place where those ants were crawling all over the chocolate cake. I had a great time there, great show. And then I went to uh, legendary Manchester, England. And um, I got to be honest with you, that was the one out of all the shows that I'm doing on this tour. That was the one that I was concerned about. I'm like, all right, this is Manchester, Man United, Man City, the fucking hooligans and all of this shit. And the only thing I, I knew about them was that book that I read. I can't remember if I brought this up Thursday. I read that book, Among the Thugs, where there was an old uh, American journal journalist. He was considered old. He was in his 30s. He was considered a good geezer. And he somehow infiltrated them. And, and just some of the violence that they fucking talked about when they were over there. I remember some of the fucking stories. Do you know there was something that... I'm not saying that this was specifically done in Manchester, but Manchester was only the, the only soccer city that I knew. I didn't even know, or football as they say. Like Liverpool to me was the Beatles. And meanwhile, the Liverpool team, before Manchester started, went on their run. Up until about 1990, it won more championships than anybody, and I had no fucking idea. Um, but anyways, I guess one of the things these fucking hooligans used to do is they'd have a box cutter, a razor or some shit, right? And they they have it so fucking sharp that they'd come up behind the supporter of another club uh, when they were standing up waiting to go in, and they'd slash right across your ass, um, you know, horizontally. And it was so sharp, it would go right through your fucking pants, slash right across both butt cheeks. All right, and was done so quick. By the time the person realized what was going on, the other person had taken off. And here's the fucking thing: it it cut deep enough that you needed stitches to close it. All right, and the reason why they they did it there was so then while you're waiting for like a week, I'm trying to remember when I used to get stitches, and depending on how bad it was, it would anywhere from three four days to like a week later they took it out. Basically, you couldn't sit down, or you'd pull the stitches out. So you can't sit down, you can't sleep on your back, and God forbid, you know, you got to take a dump. <laughs> what do you do? And I was thinking you'd have to get in that, you know, that yoga position, the table position. It's basically, you know, I don't know, just imagine trying to make yourself a table facing up. You'd have to do that and put a bucket underneath you. And then you can't tell me, oh, God, just, you know, during the process of that, it's not hurting. I mean, the fucking misery of that is unbelievable and I mentioned that to somebody when I was up there and then they talked about how another thing that they would do is they realized that you know if you cut someone with the box cutter they could stitch it up so then what they did was they put two blades side by side that were far enough apart that when you slash the person there wasn't any way for the doctor to stitch it up they had to like glue it up because the space was too big just some fucking sadistic shit so anyways among other fucking really gross things that I read. So in my head, I was just like, Jesus Christ, this is like, I'm gonna, this is going to be like a Philly show with box cutters. And um, it was the exact opposite. It was great. And I got to be honest with you, it felt like a, a, a show in like Boston. Like I really felt some sort of weird connection with uh, the sound of the crowd. It's weird. Every crowd sounds a little bit different. And uh, they had that working class blue collar, you know, sucker punched in a bar fucking vibe, you know, that I grew up in. Now, I was no tough guy. I just grew up there. So I saw <laughs> I used to see the violence and try to get the fuck away from it. Like I said, I basically fought other kids up until about sixth grade. You know, I had a bunch of baby fat. So I was like I was in a higher weight class. Then all of a sudden I like thinned out. And I was one of the scrawnier kids. And then my fighting career abruptly ended with a couple of ass kickings. And I was like, all right, why don't we try being funny from here on out? So um, after that, people just kept getting bigger and the injuries got worse. You know, people laying on the floor of the bar. Someone's repeatedly kicking them in the head, teeth getting knocked out. And I was just like, yeah, you know, I, uh, I don't want to do that to somebody. And I definitely don't want that done to me. So uh, I'm going to start... You know, I utilized my footwear a lot when I was younger. (laughs) 
walking away, running away, skipping away, whatever the fuck I had to do. Not interested. So anyways, um, after I did uh, Manchester, um, then I had my big shows in London, you know, and uh, at the Hammersmith Apollo. And I went and I was talking about all the all the bands that had played in Manchester. And uh, one of the guys working on the tour used to uh, run that building. And he saw everybody from when the Stone Roses first came out, Red Hot Chili Peppers, all those bands from that era all played there. So um, when I went to the Hammersmith one, I decided to look up to see who the fuck has played there. I mentioned a few of them. I thought it was Manchester on Thursday, but it was actually the one in London. Like Ziggy Stardust, that character, David Bowie. I thought he retired it at the Manchester Apollo. It was London. And also um, Iron Maiden did their, uh, they had a live, um, let me see if I can find it here. What is it? Beast Over Hammersmith. Um, and that was in 1982. It was a sold out show on that stage. And one of the coolest fucking things ever, that's when Clive Burr, who shares my last name, I should say I share it with him. Um, he actually played there. Um, just fucking amazing drummer. But I went to look up all of these. I hope I'm not boring you guys with this shit. But this is this is the fucking history of that place. All right, 1950s. All right, this is the Apollo in London. 19, on March 25th, 1958, Buddy Holly performed two shows at the venue. These were his last shows ever in the United Kingdom. In the 60s, Tony Bennett with... Uh, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald with Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong. The Beatles did 38 shows over 21 nights at, between 1964, late 64 and early 65. Johnny Cash in 66. Eric Clapton with the Yardbirds. Um, uh, what else do we got? I'll just kind of fly through these here. Queen, Freddie fucking Mercury, the greatest front man ever. Elton John. Oh, God, there's a bunch of kids next door. I hope you can't hear that. Bruce Springsteen, Neil Young. Kiss made their first UK appearances in 1976. They sold out two shows in two hours. Genesis, back when they were like this prog rock band. Um, Rory Gallagher, Carlos Santana. It just goes on and on and on and on. There's another great one. Black Sabbath played there in 78. Jesus Christ, these fucking people are trying to come in my room. Black Sabbath played there in 78, and their, their support act, their opening act, was Van Halen touring on their first album. Can you imagine if you fucking went to that show? Um, I don't know. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. You can scroll through all of this if you just look it up. Hammersmith, Apollo, London. And then one of the coolest ones I saw as far as stand-up comedians who performed there in 2010. The great Billy Conley played there. This fucking guy sold out 20 shows from July 5th to July 31st. Oh, by the way, Led Zeppelin, when they announced that they were going to have their reunion. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, a press conference for the premiere of Celebration Day. They did it there. So uh, in 2012, talk to the press. That's how big their press conferences are. It's like most people's you know, concerts. So there's a picture of Plant Page and John Paul Jones on stage. It's pretty fucking killer. So anyways, all right, I'm done geeking out here, but I want to thank everybody who came out to those shows. Uh, the first night was, uh, was amazing. The light was a little bit in my eye on the first night, so I couldn't quite see anybody. And they kind of fixed it the second night. And as great as the first night was, the second night might have been one of the best shows I've ever had. And I remember thinking before I went out there, you know, I'm like... You know, who knows if I ever get to come back. So make it count. Don't, don't go out there like a fucking pussy or something. I forget what happened. And a number of people were talking about all the heckles I got during the show. It, that did, did not even remotely bother me. Um, I didn't find any of them to be malicious or anything like that. I just feel like I say a lot of dumb shit when I'm on stage. And it just, I just feel like, you know, it makes people want to, like, yell some shit. I actually got to spend a day in London, which was great. I, um, cause I was there for two nights and, uh, and I also finally got to drive and see a lot of England, absolutely gorgeous country. And, um, 
so Hyde Park is like their Central Park, and I just went in there, walked around. I always look at Royal Albert Hall because I'm telling you, one of these days, I'm going to play there. Right? I'm going to do a show there, God willing. If not, I'm going to see a show there. But if I do play there, I can guarantee fucking to you, I'm going to rent a drum kit again during the day. I already talked to the promoter. I was like, can I rent a drum kit? Can I go in there, put on some headphones, and just fucking play to Led Zeppelin? Because that was one of Bonham's, I don't know, I think it's some of the greatest live footage of him ever, is their performance at uh, Royal Albert Hall. And, um, and he was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. No problem, mate. So that's definitely a bucket list thing for me. So I always go there, and I just forget about dreaming about playing that place. Just to look at it, if you Google a picture of um, Royal Albert Hall, it's just, um, it looks like it's something out of the Roman Empire. I know it's only, it was made in like the 1850s or 60s or something. Um, but it's just an absolutely incredible, incredible venue. And uh, I told you that time, a couple, I don't know when it was, like 2009 or 10 or something like that. I took a tour of it with Nia, and Nia didn't want to go because she said it was going to be boring as shit, and we got there, and it was boring as shit. But then when we went to go check out, like, they brought us out on the mezzanine level, and we got to sit down in one of the suites, and right as we were sitting down, like, the London Philharmonic was, uh, was like, practicing for that night's performance, and it was like they were waiting for us. Like, right as we sat down, they started playing, and it was one of the most beautiful things I ever heard in my life. <laughs> Nia immediately <laughs> she puts her hand over her mouth, starts tearing up and all that, and all I could think was like, you know what, now would have been a great time to ask her to marry me. That would have been the, but how the fuck did I know that was going to happen? So instead, I waited till we went to White Castle. No, I'm kidding. Um, anyways. So then last night, I got, what, I got to walk around all, uh, Hyde Park, and um, it's really incredible that, that just, just the sheer size of that. And they have a bunch of parks, um, more so, way more so than uh, Manhattan as, as far as like the size of them and everything. And uh, just to really, I mean, it, and it actually seemed like there was enough space for everybody. Um, and then after that, I went over to Amsterdam the next day, flew out. Uh, oh Jesus! I forgot the whole other part of the story. Sorry, my brain is all e- even more all over the place because I've been flying all over the place. So, and I just did a show in the afternoon, and I'm still jet lagged. I don't even know what the fuck I'm doing here. So I apologize if this is more scatterbrained than usual. But so after my my um, my second show in London, um, I was just uh, I, I I could not have done a better job on that one. I was so fucking thrilled. Thank Christ. And then uh, I deliberately booked myself in a hotel. I usually stay wherever the fuck. I don't care. But this hotel actually had a cigar bar in it. And I learned that from Cigar Aficionado. They got this thing called Places to Smoke. So if you're traveling, just look it up and they will tell you the place to go. And I went there with, um, with the person who was the tour manager. And it was just me and him. And we went in there. It was funny when we first came in. They had they were like, "Oh, we're sorry, we don't have any we don't have any seats," because we walked in looking like a couple of fucking rubes, you know. Had my baseball hat on and shit, all sweaty from the show. We just looked like two fucking assholes. So I just said, "Like, yeah, we don't." I knew what he was doing. He saw me coming in with my stupid potato face, all fucking sweaty from the show, my dumb Tiger Woods beat up golf hat. And he was just like, "I'm sorry, sir, we do not have any fucking blah 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 blah." And I was just like, "Dude." I said, dude, which really made him stop for a second. I was like, I booked myself in this hotel specifically so I could smoke here. Um, and he goes, well, you can sit at the bar. Maybe you did that. So I fucking go upstairs, drop my shit off. By the time I got downstairs, they had a table because I think the fucking uh, the tour manager guy said something. So, you know, we were able to sit down. You know, it was fucking hilarious, too. This is what's hilarious. There were plenty of seats. <laughs> fucking assholes you know they saw me coming in looking like old sickly ron howard they were like fuck this guy this guy's not bringing any ass or money in here yeah beat it go get yourself a snow cone you fucking freckled mess um oh we're sorry you're spending money here okay yo by the way there's 40 empty two tops where did they come from well when you went upstairs for two minutes all of a sudden everybody left um so 
Oh, it was the greatest. And the the, uh, the tour manager didn't smoke cigars, but said he wasn't adverse to doing it. And uh, greatest feeling ever, right? He sat down and he was smoking it and he was just going and he's gradually get, getting more and more into it. And I was happy to see that he was liking it. Then I was also nervous, like, ah, oh, fuck that. I just give somebody a cigar habit. But he was just like, he's, I forget what he's saying. This is brilliant. This is lovely. And I go, yeah, this is what it is. Everybody thinks it's like smoking a cigarette. Cigarette smokers are animals. They're junkies. They run outside in the rain. They're fucking standing next to dumpsters. They're sitting on stoops. Animals. Sucking it into their lungs. <laughs> you know? Well, I need another one. I need another one. I need another one. No, no. Cigar. It's for gentlemen. You know? You sit down. You shoot the shit. You break each other's balls. You solve the world's problems. You don't really, but you feel like you do. It's fucking tremendous. I guess it's kind of like cocaine, right? Isn't that what happens when you do cocaine? You think everybody's a good shit, and then you figure out how to run the world. Then you get all paranoid like a dictator, and then, I don't know, somebody overdoses, and everybody runs out of the room. Um, I don't know. I always stayed out of that world. Big thank you to everyone who came out to my show last night. You hear that, kid? In Holland, uh, Amsterdam. Unfortunately, I literally landed, did the show, and then had to leave. I barely went, went by the Van Gogh Museum. Just saw it, didn't get to go in, and uh, I don't know. Would have been would have been great to hang. Such a great city, but I didn't get a chance to. Thanks to everybody who came out uh, when I went through England. It's just been a great tour, and uh, so far one out of four shows is done here in Scotland. And the first one was was as fun a show as you can have at four o'clock in the afternoon as possible. So that's it. I'll check in on you on Thursday. Go fuck yourselves. I'll see you. <laughs>